right. So, time for another little um, live stream review thing. I'll be having, an, again, an edited version of this go up on the YouTube channel um, next Wednesday. And, well, I saw the Shirobako movie in theaters. Um, they did a Fathom event screening. I saw this at my local theater at my local theater. I didn't go to the bigger one in Bridgeport. I kind of regret not doing that because in the case of the event of this screening, we did have some technical difficulties that caused me to miss a very early chunk of the film. It didn't cause me to miss too much story, but it uh, I was able to kind of pick up more or less what I missed. But it was still frustrating. A, a, yeah, it was frustrating. Um, so the fundamental premise of the Shirobako movie, let me pull a couple things in mind real quick, uh, is that, um, it picks up a little bit after, a little bit, a, a period of time after the end of the TV show. Um, if you haven't seen the TV show, I can first back up. Is this a show, um, do you need to have seen it, TV show before this? Kind of yes, it helps. This is a getting the band back together story. And unlike the Ur getting the band back together story is the Blues Brothers movie. And that film doesn't necessarily require as much of prior knowledge of the band because the members of the band were never really characters in sketches on Saturday Night Live outside from, you know, Jake and Elwood. And even then, it, the film does a good job of establishing those characters from scratch if you've never watched the, the sketches. But with the... But I think from here, the film relies or seeks to draw on a sense of familiarity that the audience has with the various staff members of Mushihino Animation that we've encountered over the course of the TV show, and or Musahino rather, and um, without having seen the TV series, you don't have that, and that can be certainly frustrating. But I do not have donuts with which to watch uh, discuss the movie, but I do have a milkshake, which we'll have to do. In any case, um, so period of time has passed since the end of the last uh, end of the series. When the first season, first series ended, Mushihino Mushihino was on the had gotten the contract to do an adaptation of Two Piece, which is not off-brand One Piece. Um. I actually do say not opera in One Piece because that series ended in a way that One Piece, <laughs> uh, One Piece has not. Um, like all the many Shonen Jump great works of Toei, that thing keeps going and going and going. Uh, so they then did a second project after that, or rather announced and started a second project, which was to be titled Time Hippopotamus. And then it didn't come out. It was canceled prematurely. The production it was established moderately early on. Uh, the production company pulled out. Um, and, Mushi and Musahino fell on very hard times. Much of the staff who we come to know and be familiar with over the course of the series have gone their separate ways. Even our protagonists who were also working at the studio... Uh, Rikin Musahino, like Ima, have left the company and gone up to do their own things. So, are, are, I mean, they're still in animation and in anime in a lot of cases, but they're not at Musahino. And this, this is where the getting the band back together situation comes up. The 
Lucy, you know, get falling hard times, dire financial situations. They're having difficulty getting work. They're at best scraping by doing production assistance. And so they decide to hover, they decide to do a gamble to try and get the. Sh also, um, the head of the studio who, um, We, we you may remember as the guy who was, you know, doing lots of do, doing the cooking and that sort of thing. And specific, uh, specifically, let me bring up all the character names here just a second. That was. Sorry, Masato Marukawa, who was a described as a basically XP of um Masao Mariyama, formerly of um Madhouse and then of Mappa is now like left big he's he has left the industry entirely um in for not not Mariyama not not Masao Mariyama but um Masato Marukawa has left the industry entirely and is running a restaurant uh And, um, so basically the, the, to catch up, to try and restore their fortunes, Mu uh, Musahino decide, Musashino decides to do a film, a film that they'd actually announced and was supposed to be in production, but the company who they was co-producing with basically, um... If you're familiar with the show, you'll get this joke. Funny story. They they completely dropped the ball, failed to pick up their end of the bargain in any respect, and otherwise have screwed the pooch. So now Musahino has, well, to make a film it would normally be like two years minimum, they have to do, they're going to make it in a year. And our lead producer on all of this is our protagonist, Aoi Miyamori. And and the the film is get the band back together and we're gonna make a movie. And so here's where things kind of get different from the show. The show is much more like the show is a entertaining workplace me comedy melodrama, but it's also incredibly educational on how the production process of anime and animation goes. It is a, even with all the headaches and hiccups and overwork and stress that comes with the production of an, that's production of anime as depicted in the show, it's still a romanticized version of the process by a lot of, in a lot of respects. But if you watch the show, you'll have a general ballpark idea. Okay, here's the process from beginning to end for how a series comes to be. This one, though, not so much. We're, like, jumping in the middle of a effectively troubled film production and speeding through a lot of process that we've covered over the course of the show. We're not getting into stuff like theatrical distribution. Is it a big widescreen release or is it a roadshow release? Because... Both of those happen in Japan. Um, your annual Detective Conan movies or that sort of thing will have a more widescreen release, whereas others more niche fare will, like, whenever the um, Ladyback Cat movie comes out, for example, that'll probably be a roadshow release. I suspect this movie was a roadshow release as well. So that sort of thing. And so it doesn't, it never gets into that side of things. And it doesn't get as much into, okay, when you're trying to make theatrical quality animation in half to quarter of the time, what's different? It doesn't get too much into that either. There's a lot of narrative corners cut. And I think having seen the show and now having seen this, I now kind of understand where... A lot of the stuff in the in the movies about movies that tends to kind of catch Hollywood's eye, 
where that comes from in terms of narrative shortcuts when talking about the theatrical production process. Not because they, I mean, partially because they expect the audience to be already familiar with, and by my audience, I mean movie people, because a lot of the times these are Oscar bait. Um, partially because they expect movie people to be familiar, partially because... I think they expect, and not to expect, but the time that it takes to put into making the movie, you don't necessarily have time to do within a movie. This probably could have been an OVA series, like a three or four, like not even a four part, because that's actually getting the feature length, but a, and this is like a two hour movie. Um, with like a six episode OVA or even a full core of animation to kind of get this story across. So there's that difficulty. Other than that, um, so it turned, um, the film is very solid, the animation is very good, but the, what they end up having to do is. If you remember a lot of the fantasy sequences from the show, um, it rely ends up falling back a lot more on that. And they're very gorgeously animated, and oftentimes they include lots of references to other works, particularly works of animation. I, at least in one, I re distinctly recall seeing references to like uh, Utena and Madoka Magica and um, other similar series like that, not quite getting as far as full on freaking fate references, um, but that sort of that sort of thing. Um, and they're all gorgeously animated and very well done, but it's definitely a case of we need to like this narrative conceit that we're doing would take a couple episodes of the show to pan out properly if done normally. But we're going to do a fantasy sequence here. Um, think of it like, for example, stuff like the bit from the conclusion of the first series, or the original series, with the trying to get access to the author of the manga for Third Aerial Girls Squad after so many instances of funny story and the author being upset with how the, how the show adapts the manga. That sort of thing. I mean, that one's less of a fantasy sequence, but it has elements of it with, you know, the Shoryu belly and that sort of thing. But, like, also, like, we get a big, like, and some of these can be kind of self-indulgent. Like, one of them is a Aoi Miyamori hypes herself up sequence, and it's done in a musical number. A big musical number. I mean, it's it's good, it's fun, but it is definitely, like, Okay, we're kind of we're going in a particular direction here because we don't necessarily we we don't have the time to do this the way we would in the show. Is the definite vibe. Other than that, um there are a few bits like on this in terms of discussion of the anime industry and references to stuff in the industry that the show was doing did stuff that was clear, definite references to stuff. Things like, for example, um, the not space runaway Edeon reference um, for the show they go to early, um, early on during the production of the first series, Exodus. Here, this can't like have been like it's too late. It happened, or the event happened too recently for them to have referenced this in the show, but this clearly has to be a thing that has happened several times before because they're referencing it here. Um, I'm particularly thinking here in terms of basically, again, the inciting event with uh, Musashino is they get the rug yanked out from under them during the production process because the show, the paperwork, the producer pulled out, things weren't actually approved, there was a change in management in one of the production companies, and everything got shut down while they were eight episodes into the into production process. And I saw this in the theater, and the first thing my brain went to is, oh, Gohan, Studio Gohans and what happened with 
the Tokyo Babylon adaptation, because when the license got yanked from Gohan's because the plagiarism allegations and all of that, just this past week, news story like broke that Gohan's is doing is taking legal action for back funds or uh, animation created because they were done 100 percent principal and like animation key animation in betweens voice acting sound music everything done with the first core which admittedly considering gohan's track record for animation has a certain degree of uh of rob liefeld being getting lots of work in the 90s because of his at the, perceived at the um of what is is not necessarily great artwork, but because the man made deadlines for his, for the work that he was hired to do. So there was a definite sense of there, like, oh, this is why Gohans keeps getting shows greenlit. To a degree is, while even though we complain about handshakers, and even though we complain about, um, Wiz, um, whatever the other show was, the, the Handshaker sequel, um, and their weird backgrounds that they've, that they've done, that they've done for the things after K. Um, like, oh, this is why this hooking work. Because they get crap done on time, and you can confidently say that you do not have to worry about a awkwardly shoehorned in filler episode, like, for example, what happened with Darling of the Franks. <sighs> But in any case, uh, I did really like the show. I am the film, and I am, I am frustrated that I'm that because of difficulties with the screening, I didn't get to see the first fifteen minutes. Um, I it's I, I'm guessing fifteen minutes. Like I didn't get screened back up until about seven fifteen, and the move this movie was supposed to start at seven. But there could have also been a delay in when it actually started on the projectionist side. I can't say. Um, I missed a chunk of the beginning. And, and nice to know what I missed. But the pacing and the narrative presentation was, uh, was such that I was able to get caught up to speed very quickly as to when it came back up. Which was, which was nice. And I have, looks like I have a viewer in the chat. No, no. So, um, if you so I think nobody's watching this live at the moment. In that case, um, for those watching the archive, if you saw the movie, let me know what you thought. Um, please post your comments on the on the YouTube video, and I'm interested to know what you thought. If you if you also experienced technical difficulties, this was perhaps a fathom events thing more than my theater thing that would also that would also be nice to know to an extent uh but until next time thank you very much for watching catch you later Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.